Welcome, everyone. This is the darkest hour. And it, don't worry, because at the end, it leads to the brightest day. And we are so privileged that we have Mr. John Asuna with us. And of course, my co host, Coleman Ryan. Um, Coleman, I brag on him because he has changed his life so dramatically and he's doing everything that he can to help other people. And John, um, he not only holds a world record for the fastest punch, um, he is a master at his martial arts and um, an actor. He's done stunts and coordinating stunts and all these great things, but we didn't bring him here today for that. Um, he works with an organization that brings awareness to sex trafficking and uh, to help people with, you know, self-defense, that's kind of thing. And what I find disturbing is we don't think about these things until we see that instance in the news. And like for a day or two, we're like, oh, my God, human trafficking is terrible. And then a week later, we're talking about something else. And I think we need to keep that in awareness all the time because ladies or well, even young men. Mm -hmm. You could be grabbed up, you could be hauled off, you could be sold, and nobody will ever find you. So um, we're going to let John talk about what what he does, and uh, the conversation is going to be mainly between Coleman and John. Um, I'm going to be here to maybe throw some commentary in every once in a while, but I, I want you two to take over and go after it. John, you start off. Yeah, well, I mean, one, first of all, I mean, thank you so much for having me. Of course. And it's a great pleasure to uh, to be on again with Kyle and, and Colin. It's, let me tell you, brother, uh, great to, to meet you. Great to know you. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. It's you a know, pleasure just, to have you on the show, man. It's really honored to meet you as well. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, it's, you know, it's been a, it's been a long journey for me. You know, I, I've, I've been in martial arts for 40 years and... Mm -hmm. You know, when you're when you're in the subject, it, a lot of it is self discovery, mm -hmm. and you know you you find out uh, so much about yourself in terms of things that you do well, but also things that you're not good at. You know, and, and you help to create kind of a balance between those two. You face your fears, and you're given tools to help to conquer them. Mm -hmm. And you know, through this process. Um, so, you know, we're talking about the subject of, you know, uh, you know, self-defense and self-preservation and, you know, how somebody can not be a victim, uh, you, you know, in the world of, of human trafficking and sex trafficking and, and uh, child abduction and, uh, you know, I mean, those, those things that we don't ever want to talk about. We, we, I mean, they come up in the news and, and, and we may know a little bit about it. But what happened in my case was, you know, around our neighborhood, uh, a young girl was abducted, assaulted sexually, and uh, she survived. She survived, which, which we were all grateful. But it, this is somebody that we knew, you know, this is somebody that was one of our neighbors. And that child is scarred for the rest oh, of their life absolutely you know that that's that's a wound that you cannot put a band-aid on you know and it, it's something that somebody goes through personally and receives not that there aren't organizations to help to counsel people that have gone through traumatic experiences like that it's, it's, it's not that is whether they even choose to ever bring it up at all that's the thing you know to them uh you know it's it's shameful to them you know they 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 don't ever want to talk about that you know uh, in a very weird way they're embarrassed by the situation you know and and that's one of the things that that really has always um fascinated me uh, as human beings we are more afraid of getting embarrassed, feeling the fool, feeling the fool, feeling like a punk. So true. So feeling, like a, feeling like a punk than we are ever of 
our own personal safety. So true. You know, and and um, there's three things. There's three things that are the most real things that we can ever consider. One is our perception of ourselves, what we think about ourselves. Two, what other people think of us, of what they know about us. And then three, the truth, the actual truth in the middle. Yeah. And uh, so, so this is what happened. You know, we, we, we um, rather than saying, my God, you know, how can this happen? Such a tragedy. Well, we hope it never happens again. Uh, we formed an organization called uh, KO Cares. Now, I, my school is is KO Kung Fu, so it's it's uh, it's a branch from from uh, my school. But uh, Cares stands for Community Abduction Assault Resolution Efforts. So what we did is we went to any organization that would take us, whether it be Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you know, brownies. Uh, we would go to schools and do presentations to children on how to protect themselves and, and what to do, what not to do, what, 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 what to, what to, how to recognize a stranger from, 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 uh, from somebody that's, uh, you know, a friend, a family member, whatnot, you know, um, so, you know, a, a lot of it was identifying, identifying what the, what the danger was, what the threat was, you know, yeah, it's going to be somebody, you know, you know, we, we had a good conversation uh, with, with Kyle and Coleman, but Coleman, you know, enlightened a lot about what we talked about, and it's going to be not, not the person that you might think, it's going to be that nice person. It's going to be the person that that's, you know, to what Coleman had addressed was this kind of the life of the party, the, the charismatic person. Okay, that's my, that's going to be the person. Those are the people that I pay attention to the most are the most charismatic. When I go in a room and there's somebody that's really grabbing the attention. Um, from my experience, people who are really eager to be liked have mm -hmm. a reason, right? Mm -hmm. They want yeah. to portray this image very very quickly and get it out there but it's to cover something up you know and i'm not saying that that's everybody because there's some people who are just very lively and very great people and they go out there and they can just take the attention of a room and that's awesome right mm -hmm. but i'm just saying do not believe what you are shown all the time right you need to use your mind you need to think you need to process you know what's going on around you pay attention a lot of times uh people walk up to you and like talking about being aware of your surroundings. Someone walks up to you on the streets and they hit you with a friendly smile. I always pay attention to hands because mm. if their hands are by their pockets or if they have something in their hands, I want to know what that is. Your mm. face isn't what's going to hurt me. It's your hands that are going to hurt me. So I don't care about your friendly smile. I don't care about your pretty face. You know what I mean, like I'm always paying attention to people's hands, part of PTSD and things that I've been through, you know, talking yeah. about uh, things that we go through, but, um, yeah, you got to be aware of your surroundings. You got to pay attention to who's around you and what they're doing. You know, um, talk is cheap. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're spot on. And, and people that, that, like you said, you know, a, a lot of these people are charismatic. A lot of these people are, are uh, seemingly from the outside, what we define as, as a good person, somebody that you can trust. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, they, they, they have to have a lure you know, and for children, you know, where, where, you know, where children are, let's say, waiting for their parents to come pick them up and they're in a designated area and they're maybe around other children, but as the day goes on, they find themselves alone. And when somebody comes up to them and say, Hey, you know what? Um, hey, where do you live? I mean, I, I can, I've got my car over here. I can give you a ride. Uh, if it's not that far, I, I can go ahead and take you. You know, oh, I know your mom. I know your dad. Yeah, yeah, we're good friends. Um, or I mean, they will figure out a way to gain that person's trust. Mm -hmm. and, and and this is what I teach a lot of uh, our students and, and the community. Utilize your primal instinct to sense danger. See, we're not different than any other animal in the world. Mm -hmm. 
we're we're no different we're animals and as much as we pretend not to think that we are we and and, and this is the good part of it we're equipped with the primal instinct of self-preservation and when when danger comes i mean just if you got a dog if you got a cat right away boom right away they're, they're looking around because they can sense something is not right something is abnormal something is 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 not usual and and we have that same inherited instinct we do listen to it absolutely listen to it so it's kept me alive i've done exactly. i grew i hit the streets at 10 years old i've been involved in gang activity and and i've done almost a decade in prison and what has kept me alive is my ability to read energy i don't give a shit like i said i don't give a shit what people are saying if the energy is off i don't care about your smile you know i'm getting out of there and i'm definitely paying attention to everything and everyone um I don't. I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> you, no, you hit it, brother. You hit it. You hit yeah. it. <laughs> you sure. hit it. No, absolutely. Right. I mean, it's it's all relative, but it's all relative because if you think about it, if you think in terms of the different stages that somebody goes through in terms of protecting themselves, and, and what Coleman has said, be aware of your environment. Be aware. Be aware of where you're at. Where am I? Where am I? What time of the day is it? Am I in a populated area? Am I in a well-lit area? See, things have changed though. The dynamics have changed because back in the day, all you would need to say is, you know what, hey, avoid dark areas, avoid uh, less populated areas, don't go around to bad neighborhoods and you'll be safe, you'll be all right, you'll be okay. Times have changed because it, now we have learned that it doesn't matter where we are, who we're with, how many people are, whether it's day or night, it does not matter. Um, people that are motivated to hurt other people, they do it indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. They don't Absolutely. care. The, uh, I have three female friends that are victims of human trafficking, and uh, all three of them were put into it by their spouse or their boyfriend after wow. being in a relationship for a period of time. Um, you know, the manipulation that goes on within love and things like that is insane. So when we say that, uh, I think I said earlier, it's, it's not the guy in the dingy van with a trench coat. That's the guy you need to worry about. It is the life of the party. It's the people that are very charismatic. Um, you pay attention to a guy that's wearing a trench coat and smells like piss, you know, looks like he has lice. You don't pay attention to the guy who's, you know, standing with a, just a, I don't know. I don't want, I don't want to label anything because I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like I was going to make an example, but yeah, 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 yeah. Anything yeah. After that. So, but no. I think you get the point of what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I mean, you're spot on, you're spot on because I think everybody, I think everybody, has an idea of what is safe and what is not. But for whatever reason, for whatever reason, we tend to look at this the way this person might look. We tend to think about this person's, um, mm. yeah, la yeah, lack of- Judging that book by the cover, right? Exactly. We yeah. don't think, we always think this is safe, but we always think this is not safe. And, and we, we, when we live in that paradigm of, of of distinguishing it that way, then we become victims because mm -hmm. we're blindsided. We become totally blindsided in the situation. We, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa! I didn't ex whoa! I didn't expect that. And um, so, when we're going through this process, you know, it's, again, you know, we, we helped to develop this this program, but a large part of it was awareness, was just identifying, identifying. It could be anybody, you know. And again. We, we, we don't want to demonize people that are uh, in positions of authority. We don't want to demonize people that are in positions that are charismatic. I'm because very just, charismatic. Any, like any of my friends who are watching this are going to be shaking their head like, <laughs> because I'm very charismatic. I go out of the room and I am, if, if I'm with my friends, I, I like to be very energetic. I like to be yeah. able to the party. I like to make people laugh, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I understand and I have in the past not for human trafficking, but I've used that as a weapon. I've used my charisma as a way to gain people's trust and as a way to lower their defenses, right? Um, I would 
on previous shows I've talked about my life before this was totally different. You know, I grew up on the criminal side of things. So yeah. you have the side of trying to help. I know the side of how fast it happens, right? Mm -hmm. like how easy it is for people to get snagged. If people have this idea that it's like some long process and you're going to be screaming and kicking and fighting and, you know, if they're going to try and drag you some down some dark alley, it doesn't happen like that. It happens yeah. like that. And then it's over. And yeah, so it's it, it's not uh you got to be aware and I, I love that you're bringing attention to this and that you're talking about it because i try and talk to the women in my life constantly um from the life that i've lived i've seen the other side and it is a growing problem it is not a problem that is getting smaller this is a problem that is becoming almost more accepted in our community and mm -hmm. more accepted yeah. in the younger generation right because we're growing up in a, a much more violent time so yep. it doesn't have uh man the 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 it doesn't have the same impact on people right we're numb to a lot of what's going on and the yep. media music every movies everything out there is just uh numbing us to what's really going on so no i mean you you're you're right i mean absolutely um but it's just like anything you know just that's that's how we distinguish who are superheroes and who are super villains they both have powers that that are that are beyond um what we consider to be a, a, you know a, the regular human they they have abilities and capabilities of, of doing more and and but it's what you do with it so you you can side on the side of of, of a superhero with the, that's there for somebody beyond themselves the community the world you know they're out there to save the world or you have the super villain that's utilizing those same powers but only for a personal reason their own personal reason they're mm -hmm. only thinking of themselves Absolutely. you know and 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 you know uh, when you talk about the subject i mean you're talking about money mm -hmm. you're talking right. about money and and let me tell you that that's one of uh you know the highest motivators uh to anything that we do when you attach money to it and uh you know anybody that approaches anybody else i i grew up just again a little bit of my background i grew up on the east side of san jose and anybody that that knows that is no different than the east side of east side of la east side of oakland harsh gang bang gang bang ter, uh, territory out there harsh life is harsh you, you got to get by i have been jumped i don't know how many times in my life i've been you know had the crap beaten out of me yeah i've had my life threatened with knives and guns uh, you know so often that could have been it that could have been it. That could have been my life. I could have been gone. But, but, you know, again, you rely on your instincts to help, uh, you know, protect yourself. But uh, again, when you're going through this process, and and, uh, and and you're looking out to to help to preserve yourself, uh, that's that's one of the things that that we. Uh, need to understand about ourselves and i think we, we talked about this uh earlier every person every single person on this planet has a self-preservation instinct primal so in other words somebody's going to try to hurt us we will do something and like you like you said it, it's not drawn out although there are those people that do draw it and they mm -hmm. they they um They'll, they'll tend to manipulate somebody over a long period of time and they'll yeah. groom them absolutely. To, eventually, absolutely to eventually get what they want and there's those that are highly motivated to boom, just grab you right there and then so as quick as they're grabbing you you have to have that that same level of response and what we teach our children is once once you've exhausted everything avoidance avoidance recognizing what is what is dangerous and go the other way mm -hmm. recognize what is dangerous and there's a technique that we utilize and we call it the three-step rule so in other words um i'm gonna get up here but let's say somebody's close enough 
to touch you. And they're here. Oh yeah. No. We take three short steps. One, two, three. Those are shallow steps. And look at the range. That that they're just out of arm's reach. Just just three little steps. Um, but that's that's those three short steps is in just enough to get in a safe distance away. You say something. First thing you say, I don't know you. Get away from me. Or even back off. Oh, and I'm, the last thing, yeah. and the last thing you say, help. You know, the last word, help, is what we teach your kids. In this day and age, you never hear anybody yelling help. So back in the day, they would say, never yell help, yell fire. And then people come and rally and they'll help you out. In this day and age, you never hear help. And if you scream and shouting yeah, uh, and yelling help and drawing attention to the situation, there are good people out there that will, they'll do anything to help you out. They'll do anything. And, and they, will, they will be there to save the day. And help you through the process so when we you know when, when i'm showing them that that's another technique that, that that we teach on how to again not not do a physical confrontation but to create that safe distance between yourself and, and, and your potential uh, attacker and yell and scream and shout because that's probably the best thing that you can use the weapon you can use is your voice scream yell shout bring attention to it and, and they'll know something is wrong because we know the difference between kids that are playing and kids that are in trouble true very true very true well you know you bring up a good point because a lot of people they don't want a confrontation so when you hear help then they're like oh, i don't want to get involved but mm -hmm. if you yell fire then they'll usually come running. Isn't that amazing yeah. how th th this world is? Yeah, but you know what? Thing, but again, um, things have changed, though. <clears throat> uh, and there are people out there that are willing to sacrifice themselves uh, uh, and, and, and really help a fellow person. I'll tell you, when, when somebody's on the side of the road and, and, and they blew the tire out, there's a, I, I'll see like three or four people out there trying to help somebody. I'm going, okay, that's good. Somebody gets an accident and let's say the car's turned over. There's like at least half a dozen people that are on this person, you know? And, and when I see that, you know, I'll look at the emergency vehicles and they're coming in. Okay, everything's good. They got it under control. They don't need one more car to be out there obstructing traffic. So I'm almost always that first person that just jumps in there to help out. Uh, and, and, and whatever it might be, they could just maybe just drop something. You know, but I'll be the first person to go, oh, hey, ma'am, you, you dropped your wallet or you dropped your this or you dropped your that. I'll be the first person in there that, that does that. But I'll also evaluate the situation. But if it looks like the person is receiving the necessary assistance, then, then I'll back off. I'll go, okay, everything, everything's all right. Everything's cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, um, we, we go through, through three different stages of this. And, and the last one is the physical confrontation, fighting for your life. And, and that's the thing. You fight for your life. You don't fight the other person. You don't match your strength with the other person's strength. The person that is attacking you is highly motivated, highly motivated. They see one thing, and that's what they want. And that's you. That's the only thing that they see. And nothing, and I mean nothing, is going to stop them from achieving that. So, yeah, and again, it could be for their own, their own reasons, their own personal reasons, or there are people out there that kidnap uh, children. Uh, and again, it's not just young girls. It could be young women, boys. Um, it, it's it's grown. The, the the demographic of that has grown. Uh, and 
they're being paid to do it. They're being yeah, paid to go and grab so. somebody. They're getting yeah. paid for it. You know, so, so I mean, for them, it's business. And they're only motivated by the fact that that person is money. That's mm-hmm. money to them. That's bank to them. So whatever the motivation is, your, your own personal motivation to survive has got to match it or be greater. So when I tell my children, don't, don't try to fight this person. You don't, don't do that. You know, target the most sensitive areas of the body. If they grab you and pull you in tight, that's it right there. Right now, the eyes are the most sensitive area of the human body. I don't care how big and strong you are. You could be 6'5", 300 pounds, rock solid muscle, MMA champion. Don't, it don't matter. Poked in the finger, eye, it's over. <laughs> yeah, you get a finger in the eye, it's done. That's it, yeah. It's that's done. It. That's why, you know, and, and again, I, I'm very passionate about the subject because, and it stems from my daughter. You know, I, I, I've got a, a, you know, in raising my daughter, I made sure she had tools, you know, and, and she went through the martial arts program and whatnot, but she became a really good kickboxer, you know, and, and that way she at least had those tools to rely on when I, when daddy's not around. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so don't hesitate. I mean, and what happens when you have a, your, your daughter and your, your child and, and, you know, and you have them here and they're like a, like a baby. They're here like this and they're playing with your nose and all of a sudden they stick a finger in your eye and you're here like, take this, take this child away from me and you're here like this. That's a child that weighs a few pounds mm-hmm. compared to a, a grown man that, that has everything physically over them and they just disabled you. So that's how effective that is. You know, and obviously, you know, there's areas that are effective. You know, just bash somebody in the bridge of the nose, throat, groin. Those are the main targets. That way, somebody that's smaller and weaker has a chance to survive, you know. But if you start to match your strength with the other person's strength, that's where the losing battles happens. Because you, you put a lot of energy into something that, that, that's just not going to serve you well. Mm-hmm. Well, we need to stay on our toes because, like I say, a lot of times people don't even think about it until they see a story in the news, you know, or read it in the newspaper, you know, or see it on social media. But this stuff goes on every day. And it just because yeah. it's, you know, may not be as popular as another story, don't, don't think that it's not going on. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talked about taboos earlier. We talked about taboo subjects, you know, and um, and this is a taboo subject. People don't want to talk about it. No. He, yeah, and, and it's for a couple of reasons. For a couple of reasons, people don't want to, you know, uh, talk about it because they it's, it's almost a situation of, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And then the problem goes away. And and the problem don't go away. No, it's it's a uh, it's a growing problem. Um, it is not something that's going to get worse. The damage that it does is generational, right? Because the person that uh, suffers that abuse is usually very damaged. And like we talked about earlier, they don't talk about it. I say usually we're always damaged after you go through abuse. But the trauma, um, yeah. a lot of people when it comes to sexual abuse and things like that are, are very ashamed uh, because of the stigma that society has put on it. And because of that, they don't come forward, right? So now they not only carry that trauma, but if they have children, they pass that trauma onto that child and the way that they're living their life. Now their child is going to think that that's normal, right? You have a lot of fathers that are very abusive, very uh, womanizing and young men are growing up watching that or without fathers. You know what I mean? Like I grew up with an abusive father who then left when I was 10. And the, the only thing I ever really know of him like we, I, he's still around, but we don't really talk. Right. Um, but he showed me what not to be right. Like how mm-hmm. not to act. And that's talking about flipping the script and how we look at things differently. That's how I've had to look at that instead of being like, Oh, he was abusive and dreaming like shit. It was a, now I just know how not to treat people. Right. But yeah. people don't come forward and when they don't come forward, that passes on generationally. And that's why I think the problem is getting worse is because people aren't talking about it. It has that, ta- that taboo stigma and people are just, holding it inside it just causes rot and 
man, it's not, I, I live in, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and this is an epicenter for human trafficking. Like we are wow. pipelines for every wow. weapons, <clears throat> people. This is one of the pipelines and it's, uh, it is everywhere, right? It is not some isolated problem. And it is, it's really scary to, to think about the fact that it's not in the news. You know, the fact yeah. that people aren't talking about it on the level that it is, you know, because it is, it's terrifying. And it's, uh, I don't, I'm, I would love to be involved in anything that helps curb it, you know, anything that helps bring awareness. And I just think that, you know, talking about separating that distance and people wanting to help, I, you know, this is a conversation. So I'm going to throw in my two cents because I've had situations where one, in, one instance in particular, um, somebody I was dating was home. I wasn't home. A situation occurred and a gun went off and she was running down the street in blood, screaming for help, banging on doors. And people would look at her, turn off their lights and leave wow. and, go, and go hide in the house. Not one person came out and not one person called the cops. <laughs> wow. and, uh, so I do not put my faith in other people. And if you come anywhere near me or my family, if you get from here to me, a physical confrontation is going to happen because don't get close to me. If you get within arm's reach, why are you even that close? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's we're standing in line doing something. If you approach me on the street, don't get close to me and definitely don't get close to like my little sister, my niece or my mom, you know, unless yeah, they know yeah. you and it's like something like that, there's no need for it. And the reason I react that way is because of my experiences, right? Like yeah. it, they happen that fast and it's not, I don't have the time to take three steps. I didn't, I didn't have time to take three steps back, you know? And it was, uh, there was no talking. There is, there was no chance for <laughs> a rebuttal or any type of conversation. It was just over, you know, by yeah. the time we knew it was going to, and we talk about fight or flight, talk about that, uh, that human reaction. Um, it's very true. And I think that one of the things your course would be really good on is, is getting people to not freeze getting yeah. them used to that confrontation, right? Because I'm somebody who I've grown up in a life of confrontation. Um, so I've, I've never had that issue, but I froze in 2016. I got jumped and I, right. it was a type of situation. I've been jumped before, but this one was different. And I knew that it was, my life was on the line, like immediately. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was no time for talking. Yeah, immediately kicked my feet out from underneath me. And it was, there was nowhere to run. I was in a cell. I was in a prison cell. So it was like, there was nowhere to go. And all I could do was curl up. But that split second of freezing, you know, like I think back, what could I do? What could I have done different? There was nothing I could have done. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And uh, the only thing I could do was curl up, but it, it, it broke my face. And I'm just lucky that it was, you know, that they didn't, that it didn't go further than it did. Right. Yeah. But now because of that, because of the PTSD, you know, I've been stabbed. I've been shot at numerous times. Um, I don't trust people and I definitely don't put my faith in them because I know that there are good people. I like to think yeah. that I'm one of those people um, at my job. I respond to different security threats all day and I will put myself on the line for barely any money to protect not only mm -hmm. my staff, but the patients that are there seeking help. And exactly. I do that as a way to pay back society in a sense, you know, because I did a lot of damage when I was younger now I feel like I'm indebted to society in a sense. And this is part of the way that I can pay back is to be one of those people that will run into action to help somebody else. Right. Because I used to run into action for the wrong reason. So now yeah, yeah. why not, if I have that bravery and I have that ability to do it, why not use it for good? Like you were talking about, right. If you have that charisma, you have that power to be the hero or the villain. Right. So no, that, that, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, your story is, 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 uh, is inspirational because um, I mean for a lot of reasons for a lot of reasons you know and it's it's uh, yeah, you know, I, I, we should never ever ever cast off somebody that has had you know time in the system yeah never never well, because what real quick because I wanted to comment on this earlier I that judging a book by its cover. That yeah. is the biggest part of my thing is do not make assumptions because yeah. I have a shaved head. I'm covered in tattoos. I am your textbook racist looking person, but <laughs> I love 
I am. I mean, I get it. And, and I, I'm, I'm blonde haired with blue eyes. I have a shaved head. I have tattoos all over, prison tattoos all over me, all down my legs with tattooed everything. I'm walking on shorts. I just look like, oh, stellar member of society. But the truth <laughs> is, I am. I'm a full time student going to school for a master's in psychology and communication. Wow. And wow. I work full time at a detox center and inpatient psych hospital. I'm trying to do this podcast to reach out to people. I'm involved in numerous. Uh, addiction groups online and just trying to reach out to people who are involved in traumatic experiences like don't look at me and yeah. think that you know who i am because i promise you looking at me and being like oh, he's a piece of shit you're missing out on a on a good person right and i mean so that's what that, be there for you yeah i mean you're I, I and i really appreciate you you bring that up because you know um it, it's funny you know uh i, I jokingly I jokingly tell people, yeah, yeah, I was locked up, Stan Quentin, 12 hours. <laughs> it's a long stretch. Yeah, you know, because, and, you know, and, and the reason was, you know, I, I was, um, I was on the movie Venom uh, with Tom Hardy. Really? And, uh, yeah, yeah. So I had this great scene with, uh, and, and not, not to get off subject, but, but relative to what you're saying, yeah. um, you know, so so I, was, I played prison guard, and so we we were inside inside San Quentin inside, and uh, the scene goes is that my my character is supposed to go ahead and walk uh, Tom Hardy's character uh, into death row, you know. So so I mean it takes you know it's film so it takes a lot you know you, you get in the equipment inside the prison you got you got to go through your clearances you get in there, but you're much. you're around the population you're around the population, you know, and, and I'm wearing prison guard stuff. And then I've got this, uh, my name on there, it says Johnson. So I remember one of the, um, one of the uh, inmates came up to me and he goes, he comes right up to me. He goes, Hey, he goes, man, he goes, you, you guard or you, you an actor. And I, I went back, well, I said, what do you think? And he comes up to me and he goes like this. He's like looking at me. And he looks at my tag. He goes, you know what? He goes, you're you're an actor. He goes, you're no Johnson, man. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's looking at yeah. You know, I, I start busting up laughing, man. And <laughs> and but the, and then we start talking afterwards, and, and you know, and we're sharing a great conversation. Um, because as you know, when you're when you're in the system, good behavior is a commodity. It gets you stuff. It get you're able to do things if you 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 know if you are showing good behavior. So you hit, get extra time on on you know online on, on the computer. You you get you get some privileges. You get some stuff. It becomes something that you can you can use. And um, you know some of these guys are the lifers. You know, and I asked one of the there was a, a guard that was assigned to us. I said, so what are these guys in for? Oh, murder, 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 murder. Murder, you know, and I was going, man, you know, and it, so a lot of my closest friends have had some, some very difficult lives and, and they live their lives and yeah, you know, they've been through the, through the prison system, but let me tell you, those are some of my best friends and I can count on them and I can rely on them because when, when the, you know, going gets rough consistently. They, they've, they've been the ones that can always go to, you know, and they've got a story and, and their story is of survival uh, in, in many ways. And uh, the fact that they can share that, that's, it's called wisdom. That's called wisdom. And anybody that can share their wisdom uh, in any way, you got to appreciate that. And you got to, you got to, you got to show that, that you that you do appreciate that. So uh, I've always been brought up to, re to respect everybody mm -hmm. because everybody can share something of themselves that can make you a better person. Everybody, it doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, anything, you know, male, female, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because they've gone through the prison system doesn't make them, just that person no no not at all 
not even close. And, and uh, so, but what, you know, what you're saying is, is yeah, this, this stuff happens right away. Just, you, boom, you, it's done. They got you. It's done. So your response reaction has got to be such that way. Unless it's hard though, unless you're putting somebody in that sort of scenario again and again and again and again and again, they will react less like this and more like that. And it's just, just go right to the, right to the heart of, of how to get out of it. Um, but you got to plant the seed. You got to plant the seed. In order. And that's, that's the beginning of it. Just planting the seed of, of what to do and what not to do. You know, and, and that becomes a resource. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad that uh, I got both of you in my life because mm. Coleman, although we just met, it's almost like we're brothers already. Very true. Yeah. Very true. Um, I wouldn't have gr- agreed to do this show with him if if I didn't know his heart. And, mm. and I know where it's at. I know he he has the right intentions. And you know, John, I met through somebody else, but um, I knew right away it was more than just the fact that he'd been in movies and he does martial arts. When he mentioned what he does as far as helping others, you know, being aware of, you know, being uh, defending yourself and the sexual assault and, and sex trafficking, that kind of thing. That's another person I need in my life, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I feel this. I feel. I feel the same about you, but thank you, thank you. And I hope that this helps whoever may be watching or listening to us, because um, it could happen any moment. Don't don't think that just because you live in a nice neighborhood, it couldn't happen to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, don't think that at all. Because uh, coming from the other side of the tracks, we're we're not doing shit in our own neighborhoods. We're going to the good neighborhoods, right? I'm not yeah. trying to rob the dude down the street. Who don't have shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm trying to go to the house that's loaded. Right. So we don't. And, and the thing is I can dress the part like a, a real criminal, like, man, you gotta be aware of the person, right. And not what they're presenting because I can dress up and, and fit in anywhere. Right. But the truth is, if I still had my bad intentions, mm-hmm. it's it's dangerous. Right. Like I can I can put on suits and hang out with professional businessmen, hang out with people of the cloth, hang out with whatever, because my family comes from that. Or I can go to where I grew up. I can put on racial stuff and go hang out with rate hate gangs or I can put on gangbanger gear and go hang out with gangs like I, I fit in everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it, that ability to navigate and get around is is a is what's kept me alive really like just being like being able to read people but with with people who aren't from that you got to realize that it's it's our survival we've been doing it our whole life right so it's it's very very dangerous and we watch everything right like i analyze everything everyone does so when i'm in a room i'm watching everybody paying attention to what like who's talking to who what the expression on their face is, what they're doing with their hands, and then the energy. If someone comes up to me and their energy's off, I keep as much distance as possible. I don't care what you tell me because something's off. And I'm like, like he said earlier, you pay attention to that primal voice, that, mm-hmm. that inner feeling telling you that, do, because it's what's kept me alive. And uh, I don't care if you have to lose a friend over it, you got to lose something like that. Protect yourself because you got to take care of yourself in order to give back to anybody else, right? Well, I think of how easy it is for somebody like me to blend in because I, I've been with the wrong crowd. I've also been with the church crowd. I mean, I was a preacher for five years. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, wow. I, I worked with with the uh, the children's church. Uh, I went and visited kids. You know, they trusted me. And I mean, thank God that I'm a trustworthy person, but I knew what it took to talk to these kids and to get to their level. So what makes you think that somebody else out there who has bad intentions Mm -hmm. doesn't know how to do that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I don't know. I I know what it's like to hang around with the professionals too. Cause I mean, I I was a, uh, a supervisor for the city and I know about city government. I, I know how to blend in with that crowd. 
I know how to dress the part. Mm-hmm. There's other chameleons out there. Yeah, but the, yeah. But they yeah, have right. bad really. intentions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very it, true. It is. It is. I mean, it just, uh, again, you know, just, there, there's nobody that's, uh, that can be exempt from it. There's nobody that you can say, okay, this, this group, oh, no, 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 this group, no, no, no. You know, they're, they're always good, you know. And, and no, no. You know, just, again, it, it depends where, it depends on the want, you know, and, and that's, I mean, when you, when you break it down to that primal of a, of, of an emotion, okay, what do you want? What is it that you want? What, what's going on? Is it the money? Is, is it the sexual gratification? What's the want? Yeah. And why does it keep on bothering you? Why does it keep on nagging at you? Yeah. So it, it's, it comes to, to that level of, uh, of understanding of what their intentions are and, and how it involves you. How am I involved in this stuff? So yeah. So, yeah. Coming from just thinking about your question there, and I, I, when you ask questions like that, or when people I'm talking to ask questions like that, I try and think of why I did things, right? Mm-hmm. And what led me to do horrendous acts or, or things that I wish I hadn't done, right? So it was always comes back to the same thing, acceptance and mm-hmm. recognition, right? Mm-hmm. I was hanging out with the wrong people, and, but that was how we knew how to live. That was the way we thought that we got respect from the big homies or you know that's what was idolized in that community at that time was violence and whatever so you would do these acts that weren't you Mm -hmm. right inside it kills you inside I, i didn't recognize the person i became and it uh it scared the shit out of me to be honest the things that people are willing to do i either out of the desire for recognition and peer pressure or fear because a lot of times you get pulled into these organizations, you get pulled into different gangs and the different things. And um, it's not a joke, you know, they, yeah. they hurt people for real and they will hurt you if you don't do what you're told. So you come yeah. in under, under the guise that everything's great. You guys are family, this, that, and the other, but then as soon as you turn down an order, your life's on the line, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's, that, that's not an option when your card gets called, you have to go. So don't man, like talking to people, anyone who maybe if there's anyone listening who's struggling with gang life or anything like that, just know it's not what you're signing up for. And life takes dramatic turns very, very quickly. You know, I have a lot of people who are doing life in prison because they were in the wrong situation. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're in a car with somebody who's hot tempered and carrying a gun and they decide to kill somebody at a gas station. You're there. You're going away because you're an accomplice, you know, yeah. they pull up to a house yeah. or find some weed from somebody and smoke somebody inside because they get pissed off. You're an accomplice, you know, it's a, you got to yeah. be very, very careful of who you're around. And I made horrible decisions. I didn't pay attention to my surroundings or didn't really care. I didn't have anyone to really show me. Right. So I learned, uh, by my own hardships. Right. And there's a saying, what the, the wise man learns from other people's mistakes. The fool learns from his own. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, so I'm trying to help people wise up a little bit and share some wisdom because I was an idiot and learned, had to learn every lesson with a kick to the face, sometimes <laughs> numerous times. <laughs> but over and over and over again. Over and over again. You see this nose? It's bent as shit it's from being broken <laughs> numerous times. Bobbed when I should have weaved. No. <laughs> well, you know, no oh, matter yeah. no matter how you look at it, it's always a a means of survival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. It was. And, and um, I actually, I'm just going to share the c- c- situation. So there's one situation that's, I gave a writing to Carlana. Um, I've been trying to write a book and it's just a lot of like different circumstances that I've been through and the lessons that I learned from it. Right. At 18 years old, I had just gotten out of a juvenile detention and a program up in Montana. And I came back to Tucson, Arizona and immediately started selling cocaine and immediately went back into trafficking and into working uh, gang life in the streets and stuff like that, because that's all I knew, right? And um, that's where I felt accepted. And I went back to it was, long story short, I went to pick up one time in Southside Tucson. I had always sat in the car because the person that I was working with uh, was Hispanic and this whole organization was involved with um, large organizations, we'll say. So I was white and not welcome inside. So after months of loyal service and bringing them a lot of money, I got the call to come inside. 
and I'm 18 years old. Uh, I grew up oh. on, I had been through gangs and I, but it was young. I mean, I've been in juvie and shit since I was 15. So before that, it's like 11 to 14. And we're, we were doing a lot of stuff, but it's still like fun and, and a game. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are getting hurt, but not like they are when you're older. So now I'm 18 I come back and I'm at this house to pick up. I get the call to come inside. I go inside. Um, mm-hmm. As soon as I walk in, the whole house is just like, what the fuck is this white boy doing inside? And everyone <laughs> kind of stops, but no bullshit on my family. Um, I would crack rocks the size of footballs, kilos of cocaine sitting in this house. And this is wow. just some shit bag neighborhood, millions of dollars sitting inside this house as far as like pout product. I go, I get a call to go into the back room, whatever. Long story short, we're leaving, we're getting ready to leave. And right as I'm walking down the hallway towards the front door, the phones go off. And there's like three gentlemen in the living room and a woman in the kitchen. The woman answers the phone call, the phone hanging in the kitchen, and immediately starts yelling in Spanish. Mm-hmm. The entire house goes into like just organized chaos, right? And I'm just standing there because I don't know what to do. And I'm just standing there. One guy, all the blinds are closed. He opens one blind so you can see just barely what's going on outside. Mm-hmm. I've handed an AK-47 rifle. Well, wow. my partner and now all three gentlemen are holding AK-47s and the woman in the kitchen, right? Guy in the back is in a wheelchair. So he has his gun and the partner with him has his. They told me, you shoot whatever comes through that door. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. So, you know, let's take a second to really think about the situation, right? Mm-hmm. I'm 18 years old. I came here to buy some cocaine. That's it, right? And now I'm sitting here holding an AK-47 with orders to shoot people if they come through that door, right? This is not a situation I can walk away from. Mm-hmm. If I try and leave, they're going to kill me. I can't just be like, no, here, take this. The fuck, I'm not doing that. They're going to kill my ass and throw me in the bathtub, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. They'll drain my yeah. ass out and put me in a bucket and send my ass, off, my ass off to the desert. So my life just went from trying to buy two ounces of cocaine to make money. Well, you guess who's outside? Police. There's two cop cars pulling up out front, right? Wow. So not only am I getting ready to shoot, Now I'm getting issued out with law enforcement and I had to make that decision. What else are you going to do? So I actioned the rifle and put the butt to my shoulder because what else am I going to fucking do? You're not, I'm survival, right? We're going to do what we got to do to survive. Am I trying to kill cops? Absolutely not. Am I trying to get involved in that type of shit? Absolutely not. I was 18 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, I just want to tell people that situations escalate that quickly. It is not life altering and i'm lucky they sat outside for about three minutes he owned this entire block and three blocks surrounding it i I, I didn't understand what was going on but they cruised by sat outside for about three minutes and took off i've never been so fucking scared like just thinking about it i get goosebumps and i start shaking because it was i remember thinking like this is it it's not yeah this isn't going to end well even if this is what's racing through my head even if they do come and we shoot these four cops that are here right now they're not going to let my ass live. They're yeah. not taking me to Mexico, you know, to go party with them and shit. They're going to dump this white boy in the desert. So it was like that fast. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just going to, and, and did I stop? No. Well, wow. <laughs> doing what I was doing, you know, and I just accepted that as the life, but I just want to share with people that it's that fast, you know, yeah. and you think, Oh, I'd make, I wouldn't do that. Bet that you wouldn't, because if you didn't, you, if you didn't look like you were willing to, you'd have been dead. They'd have killed you, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's everywhere, you know? So just pay attention to your surroundings. I put myself in a shitty situation. So most people aren't involved in yeah. that type of thing, but I'm just saying, like, situations I mean, that, quick. Well, I mean, that's what makes your story uh, pretty incredible because you, you're on the other end of that. And uh, it takes, let me tell you, it takes a hell of a strong person and a lot of love and support around you. Because again, you don't, you don't do this stuff on your own. You don't do it on your own. I, I don't care anybody who's ever claimed I'm a self-made man. Nobody's ever taught me anything. No, 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 I no. Know. Yeah, no, uh-uh. You, 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 were, you, do, you weren't born by yourself, brother. You know, somebody helped you along the way. You know, you didn't feed yourself, you know, in the beginning of your life. Somebody helped you along the way. 
yep. you know, you were educated. So we were all in one way helped through the process. Somebody, you know, shared their wisdom. Somebody shared, you know, opened up a door for us uh, in order for us to decide for ourselves what we do beyond that point. But, um, but you yourself, to see it on the, on the other side and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully we get a uh, you know, good amount of people that, that watch this program and hear your story. You know, because again, you know, I, I grew up in a bad element myself, you know, and, and I, a victim of, of violent crimes myself. And to be on the other end to talk about, okay, this is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is what you say, this is what you don't say. But sometimes when it has to do with your life, you don't have a decision in the process. You're just, you're just living it. You're living it at that moment and you're doing everything you can only to survive, even though you know it's not going to end well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would, I would like to make the point to don't when like judging the book by its cover, just because you hear something that happened, right? Like people do some terrible things, but you don't know the circumstances that led up to that decision. And yeah, sometimes sure. like talking about people, a lot of gangbangers and things like that, that have these tattoos all over their face, you know, and they look terrifying and they're doing horrendous things that they're terrified right being yeah. one of those gang members being one of the things like we came from nothing we felt like we had nothing and then this organization brings us in makes us feel powerful they give us money they give us power they give us respect food drugs yeah. and, you know, they give us these these feelings and uh people are so afraid to lose that that's all they know so they'll do whatever is asked and i just I, when i see when i see these kids because i've done a lot of time in prison and there's kids coming in that are 18 <laughs> doing the rest of their life you know, they're coming in with murder raps and all these cases and they're covered in tattoos. And I'm just like, man, I'm fucking 33 looking at you just like homeboy. You got to slow down. You know what I mean, like, you're, it's already over. You already fucked up. You know what I mean, yeah, but yeah. It, uh, they're terrified. And when I look at someone like that, I see a story and yeah, talk yeah. like Kyle, how you talk about, you know, you did that interview with the drummer and, and, you, and yeah, cool. You're a drummer. Like for you, man, cool. It's, it's awesome that you, you're an actor and you have those martial art things, but hearing the story of what led you to get there mm-hmm. you know what I mean? like That's what, what made you do that exactly so if i guarantee you if you sat down and talked to one of these gangbangers and they were actually willing to open up and talk to you like the conversations i have with them it would change your perspective and yeah. when i started this idea of wanting to have these conversations with people i didn't realize uh that a lot of people didn't want to have those conversations. So I was like, oh yeah, dude, this is going to be great, man. Everyone's going to be so excited. And then I'm like, yes, you want to talk? They're like, fuck no, dude, but you're, you have a great idea, but I don't want to talk on your show. Like, oh, all right, well, thanks. <laughs> but it's true. Like, man, if you can just get to know these people, I was in juvie for the first time I was in juvie. I got locked up at 15 and, um, it was, I wasn't, I wasn't looking to go home. There was a lot of abuse going on at home, a lot of uh, surrounding circumstances. And I told them that I, I wasn't willing to go home and mm-hmm. they were, Oh, you can stay in juvie. And I was like, all right, cool. Better than going yeah. home. So yeah. I, they, they yeah. said, what the fuck? And I ended up getting sent to, I was in juvie for a little bit and then got sent to a, a Christian work camp in the middle of Montana. And that's a whole different story, but it was, you know, I took a lot away from it, but, um, yeah. Well, what was I talking about? I, I mean, we, we were talking about originally, like, just the want. Like, what, I mean, the want behind it. And you, you were saying is just to feel accepted, to feel yes, respected. The story, right? So when I went to juvie, right, at 15, there was a kid. Um, this kid was 15 years old. He's in juvie because he was in a car with his homies that were involved in the same gang that he was. And police pulled up next to them at a stoplight while his homies decided to shoot at those police officers. At 15 years old, he's in the middle of a backseat running down an alley trying to get away from the police and gets picked up, right? They don't give a shit whether or not he's shot, right? He's a gangbanger covered in these clothes, but he's just 15, just born into it, right? Yeah. I asked this kid while we're sitting at the table, uh, man, if you could do anything in the world, what would you do right now? (laughs) And this kid's response was that he wanted to go ice skating. (laughs) He had never been, it makes me want to cry because it's like, he had never been ice skating. He had never played a day of soccer. He had never 
gotten to go to an after school program. He mm. didn't get to go to school. You know, yeah. his family uh, put a rag on his head the day he was born. And mm. he, that was his education was the streets. So yeah. it's real easy to judge people, right? And look at them a certain way. But if you understand where they came from and the fact that what you think is normal, they have no concept of. They don't know that because nobody took them time to teach them like you were talking about. Not yeah, self-made, yeah. somebody taught you. And what these people have been taught is a totally different way of life that most people don't understand. You know, you know, you, know, you bring up a really good point. You know, just w- when I grew up, you know, um, my grandfather, he, I, he didn't speak English. So, uh, so he only spoke Spanish. So all the conversations were in Spanish. But, but, uh, but what he asked me, he goes, who do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, oh, you mean, you mean, what do I want to be? He goes, no, I didn't ask you that question. I asked you, who do you want to be? And I, and I you know, I'm, I'm a kid. I didn't know how to answer it. He goes, you know what? I'm going to help you answer the question. He goes, I want you to be a sort of person that shows people kindness and respect no matter where they're from. He goes, I want you, and I come from a long line of migrant field workers, long line. My, my, you know, my parents, my grandparents, they, they all worked the fields. That's what we did. That's how we got by. And he goes, I want you to treat the people around the campfire when we're having dinner at the end of a, a long day Picking, picking vegetables and picking fruit and show the same respect that you would them as you would the mayor of the city sitting at a five-star restaurant having lunch. He said, we're no different. We're all the same. And we all, all of us deserve to be treated with kindness and respect. We all have our own story to tell. And everybody can learn from it. And he goes, I'm going to ask you again. Who do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm here. Like, I'm like, by then I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, I don't want to say the wrong yeah. answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, said, I just, I just, I looked up at him and said, I'm, I'm going to be a good person. I said, I'll, I'll try to be, I'll try to be the best person to other people that I can. He goes, okay. You. Then he goes, okay. You. You might have a chance in this world. <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. I like That's that. Awesome. That is very, very good. We all ought to ask our kids that. Truth, honestly. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what, guys? We could have a conversation here all night long. I know. I know. I know. But uh, I know. Un- unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Oh my but goodness. I'll be glad to take this conversation up another time for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. And, Please, uh, I would be happy to talk with you again. Each and every week, of course, Coleman and I will come and and talk to y'all and try to give you a little bit of wisdom. Um, Coleman's had a little bit rougher than I have, but uh, I, I've still, <laughs> I, I've 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 been with the biker gangs. That's that was my survival was hanging around the biker gangs. Um, you got a family and stuff to show for it, man. I've got a prison record that sucks. <laughs> oh well, then. <laughs> Maybe I, I do have you. it rough. <laughs> <laughs> you, I was going to say, you got it pretty rough right now. Three, three yeah. kids. Yeah, right. It's all that point of view, right? No. <laughs> well, actually, f- f- five kids now and three grandkids. Man, I got, I went through hell. <laughs> uh, add off to you, man, because I don't have to do with none of that. Yeah, I'll I tell you. Eat, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> As bad as I got it, I offered up my kids to Coleman. He's like, oh, hell no, I'll go back to jail first. <laughs> oh, Great. Uh, I've missed a lot of my life. I'm going to enjoy the rest of you, you know? And uh, I, Absolutely. I, feel like, I feel like my duty uh, is to give back to people, right? Yeah. Like, And, and I, I just think that if I were to have children, it, it would slow that down. And I truly feel that if it's weird, you know, that I'm indebted and I owe it. So I don't want to let anything get in the way of that. And uh, I just think that having children would definitely slow me down. It's not that I, I don't love children. You know, it's just not in the cards for me. So 
I can't even give mine away. So no, nah, I'm not taking it. <laughs> nah, that was that was a definitive no. I don't want your children. No. <laughs> that was a quick no. 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 Yeah. <laughs> no in, in all seriousness, the, these guys, I bring them on. Well, Coleman and I both we share this together. This is not just my show. Coleman and I, this is our endeavor. Uh, we want to bring you as much knowledge as we can, um, awareness. And uh, to keep you on your toes, because I mean, just I was raised by a loving family or loving grandparents, and all it took was one bad situation to put me in another situation. And before I knew it, I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. And Coleman can tell you the same thing. All it took was a bad situation to turn worse. It's the truth. I do want to say one thing on that note, talking about uh, earlier, you said we were talking about people not talking about their trauma, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was abused from a very, very young age by numerous people. Um, one of them was in my family. The others were relatives, babysitters, things like that. Well, the one that was in my family, when my parents got divorced, um, my mother would send me to live with my father and I was terrified of my father, right? Mm -hmm. So I would act out when I was with my mom. Well, my mom thought that I was acting out because of the divorce and that I was just angry. Well, if I had had the conversation with my mother, then my life would look completely different. Mm -hmm. I did not talk to my mom. I've spent 10 years in prison. I've been a heroin addict for nine years. You mean I've been in an addict since the age of 11 is I didn't talk about what happened to me as a kid. And I didn't talk about the trauma and therefore I didn't heal, right? And I didn't talk to my mom till I was in my late twenties. And it's been uh, the most beneficial thing I ever did. It's been, now we have a completely different understanding uh, mm -hmm. of why things happen the way that they happen. And it is, I'm actually took, so what got me into school was to take a communications class so I could learn how to talk with my mother and not at her because I'm used to like yeah. being at yeah. people from being in prison yeah. and like you just tell people what to do. And uh, now I don't tell my mom what to do. She's my mother. So we, we have- yeah you know, great conversations. And um, truly, that is the catalyst of healing is opening up and realizing that there's many other people around you that have gone through the same thing. And also, people don't understand why we're acting the way we're acting. We may think that we're relaying a message, but it's not being received, right? So communication is key. And I just wanted to, to say that to anyone who may be struggling, anyone who's gone through trauma, anyone who's got something they want to get off their chest, open up, you know, find someone that you can talk to. I, I know Kyle will listen to you. I know I'll listen to you. I'm sure that you're willing to listen to him anytime, man. Like you, I love what you're doing, man. I love Thank what you're you. doing. So I just want to, again, Thank you, bro. I appreciate you, that. and you on everything that you're doing, because it is true. Yes. We need to get people aware of the dangers that are out there and teach them how to defend themselves. You know, I, uh, I, speaking of martial arts and things, one more thing I want to say is I, I try and tell people that bullying people and going out and starting shit and barking is not tough like mm -hmm. i know i can handle my business but i don't go out there and try and talk shit and make other people look small you know what i mean mm -hmm. i try and pick people up and help them realize their potential and i think that that's what we need to realize is we need to build each other up instead of knocking each other down and pointing out the differences right so i love that you're doing that man hats off to you if there's anything Thank you, brother. To talk about or any way i could help please let me know because i would love to honestly absolutely absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah, this platform is this platform is always open to you john anytime you need to talk about you know it, whether it's awareness or you have a fundraiser or anything uh we're here got this it. platform got is it. yours absolutely yeah no you guys you guys are fantastic uh, again like i had said earlier beforehand uh uh, you guys are providing a resource. You guys are providing a community service. You guys are providing uh, a a way for for somebody to express themselves in a way that they, they probably couldn't before. You know, so thank you, gentlemen, for, for doing what you're doing. You're, you're giving of yourselves, and that, that's thank the you. best. You can't thank ask you. for better than that. Thank you. Appreciate it. And for anybody that decides they want to pick on me, remember John and Coleman are my friends. So <laughs> just warning you now. <laughs> hey. All right. oh, that's cool. yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah. And You're to welcome. everybody out there, thanks for listening. Uh, Peace to you all. Peace. Peace to you all. Have a great week.
Best All luck right, to you, guys. John. Later, guys. Yeah, have a great one, guys. Bye. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe because it's only through your support that we're able to continue doing the things that we do. And until the next one, have a great, great day.